Returning to the reaction I am trying to describe, uh, we see that what we need is propagators for uh, the fermionic field for the electron, the positron, the muon and the antimuon. But spin-off fields turn out to be an object which is not so easy to manipulate. So we will take a shortcut here in order to get these propagators. We will do that uh, through analogies. We will start first with a, a real scalar field and see how we got the propagator. We will then um, take a complex scalar field, we haven't done that yet, and see how we can get the propagators uh, from the Gaussian path integral for free fields. And then we will generalize to a uh, fermionic field. And in doing that, I will put a lot of dirt under the rug. This is a discretized version of a Gaussian uh, integral, which I used to solve the Gaussian path integral for free field in the real scalar case. We got that by taking the continuous limit of uh, this Gaussian integral. So what we did was to rearrange uh, the action in such a way that I can recognize uh, the dynamical variables times some kind of matrix times the dynamical variables. And in then that gives us a solution which uh, involves a propagator D. Um, and this propagator is obtained in by analogy with uh, the discrete case as uh, the inverse of this matrix A. Notice that what we did so far was for real scalar fields. However, the spin-off fields we have in this process are not going to be real. So uh, we first need to generalize this path integral from real scalar field to complex scalar fields. We start with the generalization of this uh, Gaussian integral for real variables to a Gaussian integral for complex variables. So now if our dynamical variables are complex, we need to integrate not only over Q, but also over the Q stars, because we have two degrees of freedom for the real and the imaginary part, or equivalently for the uh, variable Q and its complex conjugate. So I'm not going to prove this integral. The proof goes the same way as what we did for the real case. Um, and you can find it easily uh, on the web. So despite the appearance, it's not a lecture on Gaussian integrals. So let's look at the difference with the real case. We see that um, in the real case, we have a one half factor in the exponent, which we don't have anymore. In addition, in the real case, the source appears only once in the left hand side because we have only one type of dynamical variable. Now we have two types of dynamical variable we have because we have uh, Q and Q star. Therefore, we need uh, the source twice. And because at the end, the action should be a real number, uh, we want uh, the um, exponent to be i times uh, the action, so i times the real number. Therefore, we need to sum uh, j q star with uh, j star q in order to get such a real number. And let's now look at the right hand side. Again, the difference is only uh, the factor one half, which we don't have anymore in the complex case. And because our source is complex, we also need a j star. The path integral for free complex scalar fields is obtained by taking the continuous limit of this Gaussian integral. That gives us a complex uh, Gaussian integral, which we can solve exactly. We now have to sum over the path for phi and for phi star, and our source acts on both phi and phi star. The solution to the Gaussian path integral uh, for complex field is similar to the one for uh, real field. Uh, the difference now is that in the phase W, we don't have the factor one half anymore. Uh, however, the propagator is uh, the same uh, for real and complex scalar fields. Notice also that the Lagrangian for complex scalar field is a little bit different than the one for real scalar field. Uh, it's still a Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. However, now uh, we don't have the factor one half anymore. Remember that this factor one half was a convention anyway. Uh, so we have it in uh, the real case, but not in the complex case. The reason why we don't need the factor one half anymore is uh, because when you plug in 
this Lagrangian into the Euler Lagrange equation in order to get a classical equation of motion, uh, you'll find that without the factor one half, you get uh, naturally the Clang Gordon equation. So I invite you to try to do that by yourself. We are now ready to generalize this Gaussian path integral for complex scalar fields to the case of spinor fields. This is our Dirac Lagrangian, which is a function of Psi and Psi bar. So this is why our path integral is over Psi and Psi bar. Notice that we put Psi bar before J because we want uh, our action to be a number. And if you think of a Psi as a column for spinor, then Psi bar is a line for spinor and J has to be a column uh, for spinor. By placing the line before the column, I get a number, but if I were to place the column before the line, I will get a 4 by 4 matrix. And similarly, for our action to be real, we need also a term J bar Psi. So the solution to this Gaussian path integral involves the effective action, which is expressed as a function of the propagator. And in order to get uh, my propagator, I first need to re-express the Lagrangian um, in such a way that I can recognize uh, the field uh, times uh, f some function or some operators A times the field itself. And once it's done, I can take the inverse of this operator and that will give me the propagator. But in fact, this is trivial because uh, the Lagrangian, the Dirac Lagrangian is itself expressed as function of Psi bar, an operator times Psi. So all I need to do to get the propagator is to take the inverse of I del slash minus M. Note that A uh, is a function of del slash and del slash uh, is itself uh, expressed as a function of the gamma matrices. So it's a 4x4 four four matrix. So A is a 4x4 four four matrix and therefore D uh, has also to be a 4x4 four four matrix. The indices A, B and C refer to the uh, columns and line of the 4x4 four four matrices. Substituting A by its expression if we don't put explicitly the indices for the 4x4 uh, four four matrices, therefore that's a uh, matrix expression and that's why we need a matrix, an identity matrix on the right hand side. As usual, such equation with uh, derivatives are easier to solve in momentum space via Fourier transform. Remember that del slash is just gamma mu uh, times del mu. So the derivative will bring down a minus i k mu. So that's the left hand side of this equation. And for the right hand side, we need the Fourier transform of a delta function, which is just one. And we still have the identity matrix. So the Fourier transform of this equation simply gives in momentum space, where we use a Feynman notation for k slash. This equation means that the propagator in momentum space is uh, the inverse matrix of k slash minus m, where, as usual, the i epsilon term is here to avoid division by zero. And it should be taken to zero at the end of the calculation of a physical quantity. We can rearrange this expression for the propagator by multiplying by uh, k slash plus m both in the numerator and in the denominator. We already saw when we introduced the um, uh, Feynman notation that k slash squared is in fact just k squared. So we can now write our final expression for the Dirac propagator. That's in momentum space and if I want uh, the propagator in space time, I just need to do an inverse Fourier transform. So this is all we need to describe uh, the free propagation of a disturbance of a spin one half field. And as usual, we see that uh, this disturbance of the field will propagate efficiently when it is on mass shell, when k squared is equal to m squared. So we got these propagators relatively quickly by proceeding through analogies with a scalar case. 
So what we did was to generalize this uh, Gaussian path integral for complex scalar fields to the case of spinor field. So of course there is a big step here because uh, we already know that spinors are much more complicated objects than scalars. Uh, they, are, uh, they don't behave as vectors, they don't behave as scalars, so that's where we hide uh, dirt under the rug. In fact, the spin statistic theorem tells us that spinors corresponds to spin one-half uh, particles and must anti-commute. This means that elements of spinors cannot be just uh, either real or complex numbers. Mathematicians tell us that uh, numbers which anti-commute are Grassmann numbers. So Grassmann numbers are just numbers which anti-commute. And for instance, if you take uh, the square of a Grassmann number, you obviously get zero despite the fact that the number itself is not zero. So these are not ordinary C numbers. It may sound like a mathematic abstraction, but it turns out that this is uh, the physical, uh, classical field for uh, electrons, for instance, is indeed made of these Grassmann numbers. Um, we, we find that strange because we don't have uh, an intuition uh, from our classical experience of the world uh, of what would be an electron field. Uh, but if we had, we would not be so surprised to see that uh, this electron field multiplied by itself will simply give zero, for instance. The analogy we used um, works well, in fact, because uh, indeed this uh, Gaussian path integral for uh, fermions, for spin-off fields, is correct. Uh, however, if you want a more uh, a rigorous proof of its derivation, I invite you to consult chapter 28 of um, Quantum Field Theory for the Gifted Amateur by Lancaster and Blundell.